Hello. Hello, Dr. Gabriel. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. It's so awesome to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. All right. So now that you're here, we can get it, uh, get this event going and get it started. Um, before we get started, I just want to let uh, all of our um, viewers uh, know about some, some ground rules and then also just uh, give you guys some details on how this is going to work. Um, so uh, Dr. Gerber is going to give uh, her talk. Uh, and after her talk, we'll save some time for a quick Q&A session. Um, so for our current fellows, you guys um, can go to the live chat and ask your questions in the question thread there. Um, we also have a couple of uh, questions that were submitted earlier on. And so uh, I will read some of those questions um, off as well. Um, but yeah, that's how it's going to be. I'm so excited um, you know, to have you here with us. Uh, this has definitely been one of the most anticipated um, you know, guest speakers we've had. So uh, it's, it's really exciting for us. Um, and for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Abdi Shamsu. I am one of the business operations managers uh, at Correlation One. Uh, and I have the, uh, the honor of uh, being able to introduce uh, Dr. Gebru and moderate um, this event for you all. Um, so I will just jump right in and, uh, and introduce uh, Dr. Gebru. So um, as many of you know, AI is essential across a vast, array, a vast array of industries, including healthcare, banking, retail, and manufacturing. While AI has shown its potential to improve efficiency, bring down costs, and accelerate research and development, it has been tempered of late with worries that these complex, opaque systems may do more societal harm than good. Luckily for us, we have leaders like our guest, Dr. Tim Negebru, who are working hard to make sure that we center ethics and AI innovation. Dr. Tim Negebru is a computer scientist who works on algorithmic bias and data mining. She's an advocate for diversity in technology and co-founder of Black and AI, a community of Black researchers working in artificial intelligence. She's a former research scientist at, in the ethics AI team at Google. And while at Google, she finished her postdoc in the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics group at Microsoft Research New York. Prior to that, she was a PhD student in the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory studying computer vision. Her main research interest is in, is in data mining large-scale publicly available images to gain sociolog sociological insight and working on computer vision problems that arise as a result, including fine-grained image recognition, scalable annotation of images, and domain adaptation. She is currently studying the ethical considerations underlying any data mining project and methods of auditing and mitigating bias in socio-ethical systems. The New York Times, MIT Tech Review, Wired, and others have recently covered her work. As a co-founder of the group Black in AI, she works to both increase diversity in the field and reduce the negative impacts of racial bias in training data used for human-centric machine learning models. The mission and purpose of ds a is to create a more ethical, equitable, and diverse data economy. And I honestly couldn't think of a more perfect person than Dr. Gerber to speak with us today. So without further ado, I introduce you all to the one and only Dr. Tim Nick Gerber. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Abdi. Um, sorry, I was a couple of minutes late. I was looking for um, the, the slides of the talk I wanted to give, and um, I finally found it. So um, let me just, uh, oh, I think I should share my screen, right? It says um, it's disabled for me. So maybe you've, um, yep, maybe you I, can I enable Rob, it. Rob is going to be able to. Uh, uh, make you co-host so that you can share your screen in a sec. Okay. Um, so I was gonna, I'll just tell you briefly what I was planning on talking about. And um, so I was gonna cover um, the first of a three-part tutorial that my, my co former colleague at Google, Emily, Denton and I had given at a conference for computer vision for academics and computer vision. Uh, and um, so computer vision is basically the field of AI or I don't know, a field. AI is uh, it's kind of questionable to me at this point what AI is and isn't, but um, computer vision is, is a, a field that tries to make sense of visual data. 
And um, I think um, some of us have grown increasingly worried about what the actually the goals of that field as a whole are um, and what it's being used for. So my colleague Emily and I were um, giving uh, tutorials uh, hoping to reach the academic community. And the first um, part of the tutorial was called computer vision, who, who benefits and who, uh, I, mean, I guess, who, who um, suffers, uh, wait, yeah, who, who, I don't know, like who benefits and who doesn't, let's call it that. So um, I'll just start. Okay, good, I can share now. Um, so can you all see my screen? I'm just gonna, uh, can you everybody see my screen? Okay, good. So um, the first thing I wanted to do was um, before we gave this uh, tutorial, um, we had also given a talk at uh, me and Emily at Stanford uh, to a, a graduate school, uh, a, a bunch of students who are taking a graduate level computer vision class. And we wanted to just get a sense of, you know, just their sense of what the field is, where the field is, right? So we asked them, you know, where do you think the technology is being used most for today? And so there was a few options like assistive technologies, personal convenience, like sorting photos, education, healthcare, art, um, mil military, and all that, agriculture. And so we said, where do you think the greatest positive potential of computer vision technologies lies? Like, where is the, you know, most benef potential benefit, I say, I, I guess. Um, so I think uh, a lot of people said healthcare and self-driving cars, et cetera. And then we asked the opposite question, like, where do you see the most kind of potential harm? And a lot of people said, I don't know why the, this, this, this label is not appearing, but I, a lot of people said military and law enforcement. I bet you if I asked this question like five, six years ago, that wouldn't have been the case because the conversation has evolved um, since then, I think pe a lot more people are aware of policing and surveillance uh, systems and, and technology being used for various, um, for those uses, for those ends. Um, so the one, uh, so I wanted to, I, I probably don't have to make this point for people here, but it's just like one thing that I think we always um, forget about in terms of technology is that our imagination of who benefits and who doesn't or how technology is going to be used is always rooted in our standpoint, right? So in, so in sociology, in standpoint theory, people talk about how you should, you know, be very explicit about your standpoint. Whereas in our field, in computer science um, and science in general, um, there is what, you know, feminists, especially queer feminist scholars call um, the view from nowhere which um, is an assumption that your point of view doesn't affect uh, the science. There's like some objective truth. Um, anyway, so to, make, to illustrate that point, here is um, Professor James Landay, who's, um, who's a professor at Stanford. Um, and he, this is an excerpt from his, um, from his uh, yeah, what he writes, a smart interfaces for human-centered AI. And he says, imagine for a moment that you're in an office hard at work, but it's no ordinary office by observing cues like your posture, tone of voice, um, and breathing patterns that can sense your mood and tailor the lighting and sound accordingly. Through gradual ambient shifts, the space around you can take the edge off when you're stressed or boost your creativity when you hit a low. Imagine further that you're a designer using tools with equally perceptive abilities. At each step in the process, they riff on your ideas based on their knowledge of your own creative persona, contrasted with features from the best work of others. So this sounds like a really nice kind of, you know, um, office that you're working on, right? It's like automated. There's all these lights that do things uh, when you need them to. Your environment is responding to your needs. Your environment is basically just like, you know, waiting, waiting for you to, to tell it what to do and it responds to your needs. So this is kind of the future of um, smart interfaces as imagined by James Landay. Um, and then here is the same exact uh, future uh, that uh, is as imagined by Ali Al-Khatib, 
where he wrote the this article anthropological slash artificial intelligence and the HAI. Um, he's now director uh, of uh, Center for is it data ethics or something like that um, at um, uh, San Francisco State you know, San Francisco University or is it San Francisco State University? But anyways, Ali Al Khatib is Iraqi American and so he writes. Someday you may have to work in an office where the lights are carefully programmed and tested by your employer to hack your body's natural production of melatonin through the use of blue light eking out every drop of energy you have while you're on the clock, leaving you physically and emotionally drained. When you leave work, your eye movements may someday come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy, determining your career and indeed your life prospects. So it's exactly the same setting that we're talking about and completely different views of, you know, what this setting might enable, right? And um, this is really at the heart, in, in my opinion, of um, a lot of the issues that we deal with in, um, in technology. It's that people who are used to having their environments kind of uh, benefit them don't have a very different view of, of how technology proceeds than people with the opposite experience. And generally speaking, the people with the opposite experience are not at the forefront of creating this, uh, this technological future. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time where, where Ali talks about some of these things like someday, um, uh, your eye movements may someday come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy, uh, determining your career and indeed your life prospects. So this is really not like a Black Mirror episode, right? This is um, ha happening right now. And in fact, um, every single time I give it an example, there's a newer example to discuss. So here are some examples. This is one um, startup called Faceception. And here is what they advertise to do. So they say that they have a bunch of source images and, and then they you know, have a facial image harvesting um, and they do image collection. And then uh, they do you know, have image descriptors, et cetera. And then what they do based on that is personality profiling. So they make the assumption that based on your images, they can profile your personality. And then they give a personality scorecard. What's the personality? It could be high IQ. It could be a white collar offender. It could be a terrorist. I mean, I don't even, I can't even believe that this is legal, but I mean, so there are so many issues here, right? Um, there are, is a history with how the IQ was created um, and what it measures or what it purports to measure and who it, uh, kind of who that kind of test prefers anyways. And so uh, you even if you are able to tell whether someone has a quote unquote high IQ from their face, should you automate this at a scale? And secondly, can you tell any of these things from someone's face, right? I mean, you can make assumptions and I think we call that racism and, and things like that, like who is a terrorist, right? Various people are always profiled by their names, by their, um, what they look like. But so now you have, companies that are funded um, that pr purport to do this and that already exist in our daily lives. Um, so this is a, a used to be an example because um, higher view got rid of this example, this um, feature. Um, so I used to give this example in all of my talks and I don't think they liked, they used to like that. But I mean, I'll still give it in all of my talks, but just give them a disclaimer that they don't have it anymore. But what they did is, I actually, I'm very curious to see, I'm gonna go back to people and I'm gonna ask, um, oh, I don't know how to get back to this other view, but I'm curious like from the people here, has anybody ever uh, interfaced with higher view, you know, when you're applying for jobs, et cetera? I'm just curious if anybody has, oh, wow. Okay, so we have, who is that? Uh, we have one per oh we have a, a whole bunch of people wow this is so crazy like okay so i'm gonna call on somebody if if they are uh if they are willing to tell us about their experience so i have 
uh, is it Angelina? I can't see your name, so I can't call on anybody. I don't, I don't really know how to do this. So what about Angelina? That's because I can only see your name. Sorry. <laughs> are you, are you willing to tell us? Yes, I am. Okay. Hi. So, um, so what, in what, in what, um, scenario did you apply uh, like did you interface with higher view well I applied for an opportunity and they got back to me and they said oh please go and uh, you know uh, do your interview in higher view so I was a little surprised but I went in and yeah they would uh, put the questions um, on the screen and then I'd have time to prepare and then they would record my answer and then we would just kind of go on i as a user didn't know that this feature was available at the time and knowing that now it it does uh yeah that's really that's really not a not a good thing because those biases are going to persist right yeah so so did you did they record you talking like yes uh, i see they, and were, were the questions like specific to your job or were they like general kind of like, per, you know, let's try to determine your personality kind of questions? Um, I think they were a mix of both. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and did you like it or did you, how did you feel? After I decided that if anybody contacted me and asked me to do this, I would not move forward with it. Okay, so that's a very, very, I, you know, it's so interesting. I cannot believe how many people have actually interfaced through higher view. It's, it's really amazing to me how they've quietly sort of taken over. Um, okay, so we have somebody else who wants to talk. I can't tell what your name is. I don't. Um, I can help out and, uh, and, and try. So I think. Uh, sure. Yeah, Takia Young. Hi, how are you? Hi. How's everything? <laughs> Good. Well, it's Good. much better now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm actually very familiar with Higher View. Um, I used they. I was used. They were used extensively back in 2014, specifically with like United Healthcare, a lot of healthcare companies. Wow. 2014. Them. Yeah. So they definitely had the video um, surveillance back then. Um, it was an interesting experience. It, and actually, was the funny thing is, I was just talking about this kind of experiences last night with someone saying that a lot of times. Like I don't like the previous person. I no longer continue interviews that have this process because most times when I meet people in person, when I do all of the other things according to the you know the protocol that they have for interviews, I have a great interview. But once they do a personality test or a video yeah. test, it yeah. always comes back with no, oh, no, we didn't think you're a good fit, or you know something was off. Even though I'm a, a stellar candidate in most cases, yeah. the things that they want. So it's very interesting. So yeah, I think I, I had to experience it maybe five or six times since then. Yeah but nothing recently though very interesting maybe mm -hmm. one more one more person who wants to tell us sure how about uh scott sure um i was doing an interview for a financial services company probably about a year a year ago i would say uh -huh. um i got to the final rounds of the interview but it, it was very strange in the sense that they told me the questions weren't that unusual, but they basically did tell me that they scored how I responded in the interviews. And there was not just a person scoring them, it was a computer that was doing the scoring about how well I responded and it was monitoring my facial reactions and my, um, and- Oh, uh, wow, hand so they told you all that stuff. I think that, yeah, and they, it seemed like it was, I mean, it seemed like it was an important part of their process. Yeah. Um, for, for ruling people in or out. Um, and the biggest thing I thought about was what that would mean for sort of that logic of professionalism. Yeah. And how that would work. So if you were not, you know, from, if you were from, I could imagine someone coding that and saying there are certain ways to react or ways to look during an interview that are more or less professional. And that could be a code for something yeah. or something that's related to class or race or gender or even a neurotypical issue. Yeah. I mean, so exactly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna continue on with my thoughts on that. Thank you for, um, this is always so interesting when I talk to people. So, um, uh, okay, I'm, I think I'm trying to get to, um, I'm gonna try to, um, all right, yeah. So they, um, 
so higher view had sent me some I, I guess some report on um, their decision uh, I mean the results of a third party auditor so a third party um, audited them and I've been very uncomfortable with this particular feature for a long, long time. And notice that a lot of these organizations, um, you know, I think when we talk about ethics or whatever in technology and anything, there's always the con con conversation about who they try to appeal to, right? So all these organizations are trying to appeal to the people who pay them. And who are the people who pay them? It's, you know, uh, employers, uh, corporations, or others who are trying to employ people, right? They're not trying to appeal to the the interviewee or the potential person who's about to be employed. They're trying to appeal to like the employer. And I think a lot of times the root of our issues with technology are it precisely that tech. You know, whatever you're building, whatever people are building, you're always kind of try to appeal to someone and who is that someone that we're trying to appeal to right it's always many times it's somebody with power who will pay us or who'll give us an opportunity or whatever and then it becomes a more conservative force tech becomes a more conservative force that preserves the status quo so in this case i'm imagining so many things like i know that higher view has been used by so many different companies and nonprofits across the board in so many parts of the world, including governments, including all sorts of agencies. And now I can imagine in addition, and now I can imagine uh, this one company being a single point of failure for any job anywhere that I apply for, right? Um, and a lot of times actually people in more privileged positions are, go through um, automated kind of a tools less. Um, so Virginia Eubanks talks about this in her book, Automated Inequality, Automating Inequality. People in less privileged positions applying for, you know, uh, different job positions are more likely to go through automated um, kind of these kinds of automated tools. So now I'm imagining if this was a single source of failure, what if it always kind of um, classified me as angry, right? Or something like that. The second thing, though, is that what is it classifying? We don't even know, like, what features was it using? And the third thing is the tests of these personality tests and other things that have already been shown to be harmful and really meaningless, right, that were many times developed by pretty racist and sexist people now being automated into our, our daily lives. I mean, we can go on. I think all of you have raised many points, but this is just one example I wanted to give. And even without this feature of um, the face of the feature that they have um, of, of recording, I, I still have, you know, a lot of concerns with taking out the human in general. Um, and I mean, it, that might sound weird talking about AI, but, you know, you want people to use tools, you want to kind of people to have tools, but the moment we take out humans, I mean, humans, yes, you know, we are biased, et cetera, et cetera, but we also have taken a lot of context when we make decisions, right? And so completely taking that out is, is kind of, I, I have a lot of um, kind of concerns about it. Um, and then completely taking out the many humans making many different kinds of decisions and replacing it with this one thing. It's not even like different approaches to the same problem. Same problem is problem is this problem is this one is very dangerous in my view. Um, they claim that a lot of people who have hired they, using higher view um, have had a more diverse quote unquote workforce. Um, and so they've hired more diverse people than they would have otherwise or than they did in the past. And so they higher view says that they uh, remove, you know, they reduce human biases. I'm skeptical of this view. And I think that all of these organizations need to be i mean they need to be they need to be more transparent about what they're using and right now like they're not required to do anything right and i didn't know that higher view had gone or had been around since 2014 and probably before right and now that we're talking about this is 2021 it's going to be how long and if there's ever any regulation they would have infiltrated like so many different or they would have been used by so many different uh, 
organizations and, and places in the world already. So a regulatory body is always extremely, extremely behind when we, when we talk about these things. Um, so that's just one example. Um, another example is face surveillance. Um, so this, I guess, higher view is a form of surveillance, right? It's like you're you, now it's kind of like micro surveillance for you to get a job, you have to be surveilled by this algorithm and all of your facial reactions or whatever are being surveilled. Then there is the case of law enforcement. Um, and this is one example. Um, I think this is during uh, these are, yes. So during these protests in 2016, I believe. Um, so the, yeah, the Freddie Gray uh, protests. And so what the Maryland was doing was they were using uh, face surveillance. So when people were protesting and they put their images, you know, on social media, what the police did is that they would go and try to identify which people were uh, protesting and try to link them to their social media profiles and then to um, target them for unrelated arrests. They would look at who had, um, who had um, arrest, outstanding arrest warrants, right? And um, I mean, this is very common. This was also happening last year um, during the Black Lives Matter protests here in the US. And, um, and so actually, I don't know if I have it here, but somebody came up with a tool to using face detection. So not face recognition. So face detection is kind of just, just detects that there is a face, doesn't recognize whose face it is. And what this person did was created a tool to kind of cover everybody's faces using face detection. So you could then first pass your photo through this tool and then upload it to social media so that, or whatever, so that, so that the police can't tell who's, um, who's in these photos. But this is the kind of stuff that's happening. Um, and this happens everywhere. Like for instance, imagine, you know, I, I'm um, of, I don't know if you hear my, my dog sneezing. Um, I'm of Eritrean descent and the country has had like a dictatorship since, I mean, never had an election, never had anything really. And um, so there was, uh, protests are unheard of, um, completely unheard of. And there was one very recently and people took videos um, and, and then P the, the authorities were looking through by hand to find out, you know, who, who was in the protest so that they could arrest them. Now imagine being aided by face surveillance systems and databases of everybody, et cetera, right? They could do this much faster, um, which, is what, which is what the authorities in the US were, uh, were basically doing. Um, so a lot of times when we, when we are in data science, uh, we forget that like all, all of our data sets actually, um, have people, right? Mostly they have subjects and objects, those who collect and those who make up the collected. And so Mimi Onuha says, it's imperative to remember that on both sides, we have human beings. Sometimes we abstract away the human beings and, and we kind of arrive at many different issues when we do that. So one, so when I was talking about how um, a lot of times when we are building products or something like that, we always appeal to a certain uh, power to a certain group. And generally speaking, those people are not people in marginalized positions. One project that I know of that's the complete opposite is this project called Our Data Bodies. And I really appreciate this project because they are working specifically with formerly incarcerated people, people who are homeless, and um, because of these um, databases that they're in can't get, have issues getting shelters, uh, people who have issues getting employed, etc. cetera. Um, and so, uh, this is this is the the group. Um, I don't know. I, I guess Tuana said she's uh, no longer in it, but um, this is the various people in the group. And so Sita gave a talk um, uh, a while back at this uh, this uh, workshop. It's it's out there if you want to uh, look for it. It's it's still out there. So one of the things she said was um, she talks about the problems with abst abstraction. She says I have heard computer scientists present their research in relation to real world problems as if computer scientists and their research is, um, is not in the real world. I listened to papers that tended to uh, disappear people into mathematical equations. Marginalized people are demonized and deprived. What is the point of making data-driven systems fairer if they're gonna make institutions colder and more punitive? So I wanna give an example of this. 
as in uh, what's the point of making data-driven systems fairer if they're gonna make institutions colder and more um, punitive? So in 2018, uh, Joy Bull Amini and I published this paper called Gender Shades. And what this paper showed was that commercial gender um, recognition systems uh, have much higher error rates for uh, darker skinned women than lighter skinned uh, men. So they almost have zero error rates for lighter skinned men and much higher error rates for darker skinned women. So here, the numbers you see are, you know, if you flip a coin and guess, so they only cover, uh, you know, binary genders here, and they make us a, a bunch of assumptions about society, which I'll talk about later. But if you flip a coin and guess, your, um, your, you know, you just guessed, you didn't know, uh, you would get 50% accuracy, right? 50% error rates. And your error rate will be lower and lower, the more and more accurate you are. So here we see for women, the, the um, higher and the darker and darker the skin tone, uh, the higher and higher the error rates, almost reaching random chance for the darkest um, one that we have here. And when we published this paper, it made a lot of waves. Um, it's, 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 it's resulted in a lot of good things that I, um, <coughs> excuse me, that I'm uh, seeing right now, like conversations about surveillance, bans, et cetera. But there was other kind of things that happened. So, so uh, we, we kind of uh, figured that the reason that this disparity exists is because even though people have been working on face recognition forever, um, the data sets that they use were very, very skewed. So heavily lighter skinned, heavily male. And so we had to come up with our own data set to do this kind of evaluation. Um, and so there's other works that showed this. So this is an, an example of the uh, publicly available data sets that are used in computer vision. And here you see um, on the left where the data sets come from. Uh, and so it's mostly the US, mostly Europe. And then on the right, you know, obviously that's kind of not correlated with the world's population where we see on the right. And so um, I, I can, um, and, and this is another work that shows how uh, biases in such data sets can propagate um, through models and be amplified. So, um, so here, for instance, we see that um, when you recognize, so when you have uh, object recognition modules, so here, for instance, on the, on the first, on the left, you see the ground truth is SOAP in Nepal and all of these different APIs, Azure, Google, et cetera, they're saying, you know, they're classifying it as food. Um, the, uh, the ground truth is SOAP in the UK, they classify it correctly, right? The ground truth is spices, in the Philippines, it's not, it's not, it's misclassified. Ground truth spices in the US, it's classified accurately. And, you know, and we've kind of come to the understanding that a lot of this is because of the imbalance in the data sets that we have. Um, so here's another example where, you know, there is um, a classification of weddings, right? So here is a wedding ceremony, a very, you know, Western heteronormative kind of view of uh, weddings. Whereas all, all the way on the right hand side, they're not classified as a wedding or, you know, bride and groom, et cetera. It's just people. So um, again, so you have this kind of bias, right? You have this kind of uh, bias of misclassifications for certain groups of people. And this is not unique to AI, right? Like um, this has happened, for instance, when um, uh, cars were being built, right? Seat belts were being tested. Um, I mean, crash, uh, crash, uh, what are those things called? The bags, right? The crash dummies. Cra yeah, but like the the bags that come out when you crash. Air, air airbags. Airbags. Airbags, <laughs> right? So airbags. Um, when what? Yeah, exactly. So when when they were testing them with these uh, dummies, they were mostly testing them with um, dummies with prototypical adult male characteristics, right? So a lot of car crashes were disproportionately killing women and children for a long, long time. So this kind of like not diversifying, quote unquote, diversifying your data or your subjects is not just unique to AI. It happened in um, cars. It happened in medicine. Um, a lot of, you know, so eight out of the 10 drugs that were uh, pulled out of the market and I believe like very late, like 1998, 2000, whatever, um, disproportionately negatively affected women. 
Um, and nowadays, a lot of, you know, uh, researchers are talking about how the next generation of drugs won't really work on people of African descent because the, you know, the genomic revolution or whatever does not, that includes less than what 1% African genes, right? Even though African genes are um, some of the most diverse. Um, so anyway, so this is not unique to AI, but all of these issues that we're seeing are just kind of being propagated at, at scale within AI because all of these things are being automated now, right? Like healthcare, um, you know, automobiles, their self-driving cars, et cetera. So, but the thing is, so once um, our paper came out, by our paper, I mean this work, this work showing the um, disparities in error rates and basically face-related facial analysis systems, including face recognition, face surveillance systems. A lot of people kind of did more follow-up work that showed that, you know, we need to diversify our training data, our test data, et cetera. So that was good. Um, people got, got the memo that we need to diversify our, 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 our data sets. But the problem is that, that the conversation sort of stopped there, like at the time, right? So it's like, okay, if the, 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 the you know, solution to everything became we need to diversify our data sets. So, you know, so for instance, uh, here at, when I was at Google, um, there was this, uh, this kind of um, headline that showed that people were trying to get photos of darker, you know, people with darker skin. Um, and they were using what it says dubious tactics because they they wanted to make sure that their phone uh, that they were I mean the camera that they were developing worked well on dark people of darker skin. Um, here you have you know people in the trans community where their photos were grabbed without their consent, um, and you know and then there was this diversity in faces data set that IBM had put in put out that they had they later took down because it was supposed to help people test out face related. Um, uh, kind of models, but then they took images from Flickr and, you know, when people put images from Flickr to that, in 2005 or whatever, they weren't like anticipating that it would be used for like a face recognition system, right? So then it was this lawsuit, I think this lawsuit is still going on, uh, that it violated the Illinois biometric law because one person found themselves in this data set. Um, and then this you know, data set was taken down. And then, you know, Microsoft says, oh, you know, uh, based on this paper, we have now like changed our model. Now it works well on everybody. So that you don't see this disparity in error rates, um, you know, where it is much higher error rates on people of darker skin. Um, so uh, what, what did we miss in this whole analysis? Uh, that's the, what we missed is the question, should on a model looking at someone's face and then inferring their gender and especially in binary manner, male or female exist in the first place, right? We're talking about making it fair, working on uh, cross skin tones and this and that. But the very first question is, should this thing even exist? And <clears throat> a lot of people in the trans community especially would say no. Um, and they've written uh, about it. They've been written about the harms of automatic gendering, uh, uh, automatic uh, gender recognition systems. Um, and so this is what I mean by kind of not having a reduction in sort of um, understanding of what fairness means, right? So the very first question should be, should this thing exist and how would it harm people in specific communities? And most of the people who would know that are the people who are who, who are most affected by such systems, who've had to think about this for a long time. Um, so, um, and then let's move on with uh, what people do in terms of trying to harvest, to diversify their data sets, right? So here's an example of China trying to quote unquote diversify their data sets. And they're collecting, you know, um, lots of African images because their uh, databases don't have African images, right? So in Zimbabwe, but are Zimbabweans benefiting in any way from this? No, uh, but we obviously don't have to go to China, right? I, I really dislike this dichotomy that people put out. Uh, there's a lot of conversations within the US, you know, and its allies, I guess, um, when they talk about AI, they, they frame it in this AI race with China, you know, authoritarianism versus democracy, et cetera. And I, and I think that is true reductionist and kind of hypocritical in many ways, because here in the United States, we have, um, so there is this um, uh, report called the Perpetual Lineup Report from Georgetown Law, where they talked about how 
literally one in two American adults is in a law enforcement face recognition database. One in two of us here are in a law enforcement face recognition database. They can use it in whatever they want. And they're, they, we, they don't, we don't know, you know what kind of uh, systems they're using, what their accuracies are. We could use systems. They could be using systems that are, have much higher error rates on darker skin people. And in fact, we just found the first unknown case of someone misidentified by a safe face recognition system and arrested because of it, Robert Williams of Detroit, who obviously was a black per, uh, man. And then there was a second case uh, most recently, which I forgot where. But this, this article came out in 2016. And um, when they wrote this report, they weren't advocating for a ban of face recognition usage by law enforcement. They were asking for like regulation. But then they had a follow-up report uh, called America Under Watch. And this was in 2020 or 2019. Yeah, and after this one is when they started advocating for a ban. So uh, they just talked about how ubiquitous it is and how you, it's used by law enforcement everywhere, by ICE, by you know um, police, et cetera, with absolutely no guardrails for how to use it. So for instance, um, they talk about a case where uh, somebody was like, oh, we want to lead for this person. And this person sort of looks like Woody Harrison who's a famous actor, but, um, but let's Photoshop his eyes. And like, you know, we have a Photoshop version of Woody Harrison and let's put it in the, you know, you know, the system that would then retrieve nearest neighbors that look most alike this image. And then you, you're gonna go pursue those people, right? So this is obviously a violation of their civil rights. So this is the kind of stuff that's been happening. And, but thankfully nowadays there is, um, many cities have banned um, law enforcement's use of face uh, surveillance, and it's been spreading. And I don't think there's going to be, you know, a federal ban anytime soon. But I think there's like state legislation that people are debating, etc. So you might want to see in your local kind of um, where you are. For instance, Tuana Petty, who I talked about earlier in the our, our, uh, our Data Bodies project, has really been working to have Detroit um, on a, a ban face um, surveillance because Detroit is extremely heavily surveilled um, and not to the benefit of the Black inhabitants of the city. Um, and so a lot of times it's difficult, um, you know, to see the harms of certain technologies if it's not like directly linked to killing someone, right? Like, so for instance, when you talk about a landmine or a bomb, I think it's it's much easier. You're like, well, this thing is only built to kill people. So like, what do you mean it's not harmful? Whereas in face recognition, it's very difficult, right? Because you're just like, well, humans recognize faces. So what's the problem with, you know, computers that recognize faces? So the thing is that technology amplifies our intent, what we want to do. Right, so it's all about our current society. So that's why uh, people in SDS, science and technology and society scholars call it a socio-technical system. Socio-technical systems means when we build technology, we have to think of it as situated in our in the world. That means who's building it, what's the power dynamics, what the political dynamics, who is benefiting, who is not benefiting, who's harmed. So now, when you talk about face recognition, um. Humans can recognize a few faces, but they can't recognize six, you know, billion faces. They can't connect them to databases and instantly look stuff up and instant and track them across, you know, in mass across scale, remotely sense them. I can't recognize, I can't remotely like track people in like the other side of the world and like send drones to follow them around or anything like that, right? So there's a limit to what humans can do. And but humans. You know, like I said, technology amplifies our intent. So here is an example of that. My uh, my colleague, um, Unso Jo, who's a historian, we wrote a paper together, had shown me this um, example. So this is an example from uh, World War II, where Life magazine had was trying to teach Americans how to distinguish between Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. The reason being, you know, go, go do, go, you know, 
go do whatever you want towards Japanese Americans because we hate them, but don't target Chinese Americans. Um, Japanese Americans are our enemies. So like here, here is how you can distinguish between Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans. Who knows if you can even do that. But if you, even if you could, um, should you be doing this, right? It's unethical. But the thing is this kind of stuff now is happening at scale using uh, networks of cameras and face surveillance systems, right? And so, and so that's why I think that face surveillance is very, very dangerous and something that we should definitely think about, discuss sort of banning in, um, you know, in, in an international context. And so many times, I think people think things are inevitable. We talk about technology as if it's inevitable, the cat's out of the hat or back, whatever it's called. But I, I think, you know, technology is used, is only inevitable if humans allow it to be inevitable. And so I, I think that this is something that everybody should be aware of. Um, and um, so in, in uh, last year, Amazon um, uh, announced a one-year moratorium to its um, recognition system. Uh, which is uh, which they were selling to law enforcement, and um, so there's always you know who builds these things, uh, and so this is a, a photo that I have of a, a conference called iClear, and so like we can play you know what is uh, like a Where's Waldo right like can you recognize a black person in here? No, okay like I, I'm not even gonna do that to you. There's no black people in this in this in this photo. These are the scientists and engineers who are designing the kinds of systems I'm talking about, right? This is one of the biggest academic conferences in machine learning. Um, you barely have any women. And so people like me walk into rooms like this and we're like, oh, okay, this is definitely not, um, definitely not for us. But then on the other hand, you, you look at who are the people most um, affected, negatively impacted by it, regardless of whether it's in the US or China or wherever you are. It's always, there's always some group that is marginalized. And in the US, obviously it's black and brown communities and other communities. Um, and there's minority communities and other places, but they're not represented in, in the group of people who are building and advocating for this technology. Um, and so why is it super important to have these people represented in, in, in building and advocating for this technology. I mean, I'm obviously preaching to the choir, but I wanna give you an example here. So this person is Deborah Raji. And so Deborah Raji um, uh, wrote a paper showing that Amazon's recognition system uh, had potential biases um, so uh, that are similar to what we showed before with Joy Bolamini that it's probably uh, least accurate, that it probably has really high error rates for uh, people of darker skin rather than, um, and no error rates for uh, people of light, you know, especially men of lighter skin. She came out with this paper and VP after VP attacked her uh, and tried to discredit their work. And uh, I mean, as we know, uh, you know, Robert Williams, people like him have been wrongfully obviously uh, been uh, arrested because of systems like that that are biased. And uh, VP after VP attacked her, her work. And uh, me and a colleague of mine, Meg Mitchell, for my former colleague at Google, who also got fired, um, at the time, we spent one whole month kind of writing a point by point rebuttal uh, to come to their defense and um, collated a bunch of academics, and they weren't able to kind of get away with it. So, why did I? give you this example because um, Deb, you know, really she was an undergrad at the time and she put her career and her like health and uh, many things on the line when she worked on technology to, um, to minimize the potential negative impacts in her own community, right? This is not the kind of risk a lot of people take. And Deb, um, so this is a uh, black and AI. So Deb told me that, you know, uh, she, was going to drop out of the whole tech industry way back um, before she found Black and AI. And we had our first workshop and she changed her ticket. Um, she was supposed to leave that night. She changed her ticket to stay, um, to be at the workshop, et cetera. And then she said that that basically changed her life. And she decided to stay um, in the field because it, it, it wasn't a rooms like this that we had. We had a room like this full of um, uh, black people, and um, this kind of showed her that she belonged. 
So then fast forward to um, now, she's, you know, a very well-known researcher. She got the, um, uh, you know, 2020 elect um, EFF Electronic Fund Chairs Foundation Pioneers Award for works like this one that I'm showing here. Um, so, oh, this is too long. I'm not going to go through this. Um, but one thing I want to say is that um, a lot of times people call me an activist rather than a scientist, and maybe I am, you know, by, by necessity. But um, in our field, there's a lot of kind of, it, it's usually done not in, a, in the most kind of, um, let's say, you know, complimentary way. It, people usually do it to separate you out from the scientists. Oh, so, so is the scientist, but then there's also the activist. Um, and a lot of times this is also done by authoritarian governments or other governments to um, kind of when they're trying to um, uh, target journalists, right? They're like, oh, that is not a journalist, that's an activist. So this is a tactic that's used in our, in our field. Um, but many of us have to be um, activists by just, but like by necessity, right? And it, it's obviously, and it should never be seen as a, you know, it should be a compliment. Like when someone says this and um, it, you're an activist, it shouldn't be um, said in a, in a sort of a direct, like, I don't know, um, derogatory way. But, but the last thing I wanna talk about is um, so now, so remember I said earlier, um, they were, you know, there was really no conversation about bias, et cetera. Then the conversation evolved to be like, oh, let's diversify our data sets, right? Without really thinking about um, the societal context, like systems of power and oppression, et cetera. Um, then, uh, then, you know, so we're also like, okay, let's diversify, you know, um, X. Uh, but the thing is, the, the, the second evo uh, evolution of that conversation is that, oh, we need ethics boards. So that's the, the, the current conversation. Oh, we need ethics boards. We need ethics boards for this. We need ethics boards for that. We need um, ethics-based kind of curriculum. We need ethics-based things, right? But then look at um, the people involved in the ethics-based X, whatever it is, whether it's a board, whether it's a you know, class or whatever. This is not gonna work, obviously. Like we, we're back to square one where the people most impacted by this technology, most potentially negatively impacted are not at the table, do not have any sort of power. So obviously whatever ethics things, you know, we come up with are not gonna work. So that's currently in my view, the state of affairs. This is currently what's happening. Um, and uh, so um, people call it, you know, parachute research. Um, so for instance, this is so common in international development or drug development or whatever, where people assume that people in impacted communities are, are like uh, either don't have the necessary knowledge or don't have the necessary uh, skills or whatever. So they come in um, and they study them or they use, um, I don't know, their context or whatever. Then they go back and this group of people is benefiting, right? They're publishing papers or they make money from their drug delivery, uh, th their drug um, that they, you know, discovered, quote unquote, or whatever. And this group of people ends up being exploited, right? Um, and, and then the work is even not as a subpar because collaboration is always, you know, better than, you know, exploitation, even if you're just looking at the quality of the work. So this kind of thing is also happening in the world of ethics and AI or fairness research or whatever you want to call it, right? Where like there's a group of people who um, are making their name, money, whatever it is, studying this other group of people. And this group of people is not necessarily being uplifted by the work. And so it's really important to always think about what, you know, uplifting a community also looks like, not just using them as, so Joy calls it, you know, studying them like, you know, people like caged curiosities, right? So it's always weird when you go to a conference or something and people, person after person gives black people as an example. For instance, you know, when we look at incarceration rates or whatever, and you look at black people versus white people, or for instance, whatever. And, and so person after person is giving this talk and you're just like, you know, in a room with no black people or, <laughs> and, and you're just like, you know, it feels like, um, I don't know, I always say it feels like natu natu nat um, National Geographic. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like observe the marginal, the marginalized person in their natural habitat kind of thing. And so that's, that's, you know, parachute research. That's not really how I think research should be done. Um, so this was the, the work I told you guys about earlier, where, um, 
where like, uh, you know, you could put your photo and it would obfuscate people so that they wouldn't have to be targeted by law enforcement. So I like work like this from the perspective of people who are most negatively impacted, right? And so I'd like to see more work like this. Um, so this is Tuana Petty. Um, like I said, she's trying to fight um, face surveillance in Detroit. Um, she has this article that I really like in Logic Magazine that you can look up. Um, and then finally, I really like this, you know, there are people who are fighting back, right, with various things like, um, you know, fashion is one of them. So all of these is, is, is fashion that fools face surveillance um, systems. Uh, and so a lot of activists would uh, wear this. I even saw a video of one, uh, one in Russia or Russian activists having some makeup so that they, they wouldn't be able to be recognized. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just end there. Uh, this is just an example of work works I'm doing currently to, for instance, use computer vision to. Um, so this one is a, a, a work that I'm doing with a, a student in South Africa, um, Raseja, uh, who grew up in a township where we're trying to quantify uh, spatial apartheid using computer vision. So here on the left, you see the townships on the right. I mean, it's very easy for you guys to see, right? And so the question is, even though apartheid has quote unquote ended, um, this, this kind of spatial apartheid has not changed. So those are the kinds of works I'm interested in from the perspective of people in um, impacted communities. Um, and I'll just, I'll just stop there because I went for a long, long time. So uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I can stick around for a bit to um, answer some questions. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gabriel. We have a lot of questions that came in, so, um, you know, but we want to be respectful of your time. So we'll ask a few and then um, go from there. Um, so to start, uh, Jamar Souza, are you online? And if you are, can you please uh, hop on and ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Timnit, for giving this um, talk. It was really insightful. And um, as scary as some things are, I'm excited that we have so many brilliant people in the room who are looking to help solve these problems. Um, that said, um, you know, many people face injustices from large corporations. Um, but you were one of the few that chose to publicly speak out. Is there anything specific that um, made you feel compelled or more so empowered to do so? Um, and what advice or inspiration would you share for others who may find themselves in similar positions? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I'd been in the industry, in tech, working at tech companies or whatever, since I was 22 years old. I'm now 38 years old. So that's 16 years. And during my 16 years, I've tried so many different kinds of like strategies to survive. So like my first job was at Apple and I just, you know, was happy that someone gave me a job. I was happy to just be working. I didn't like negotiation. I heard this guy talking about negotiating his salary and I was like, well, what are you, I didn't know you did that. And, you know, and all sorts of things happened to the point where I was going to quit, but I, I didn't have words like microaggression or mansplaining or um, all of these words that I think are very good, very useful to name the kinds of things that you're experiencing. And so I, I, I was constantly second guessing myself, you know, and being gaslit. Um, and um, over time, I started kind of uh, being like, no, I, I started understanding that this was a real thing that I was experiencing. Um, and so a lot of things, a lot of times what I would do and is, you know, kind of not respond in the moment or whatever, and it would just fester. And one day I'm like, boom, you know, <laughs> and you're like, where did that come from? Um, and I, I still have tr trouble with that in many contexts, but um, at Google, when I joined Google, um, I had by then I had experienced so many different environments um, that were just so painful. I was very wary of what environment was I going to join? How am I going to survive? I was like really trying to make sure that it was an okay environment. I was already having issues during my negotiation process, etc. And right off the bat, I went in, you know, with lots of issues, and I was speaking up from the very beginning, um, and I was you know, trying to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I was speaking up. And the reason is that, the reason being that um, I was at a point in my life where I was okay walking away from the job. 
like from day, from the very beginning, I walked in being like, I'm okay walking away from, from the job. And that is kind of a certain amount of privilege because I had been in the industry for a while. Um, that means I had safety nets. That means, you know, I wasn't so worried. What, what, what am I, what's going to happen, you know, if I don't have this job? So that's number one. And so if we want people to speak up, there's always incentives. It's like when I want someone to do something, I have to also, I think, work on an incentive for them to do that. So what's their incentive to do that? Many times people speak up and the backlash is so strong from the corporations, from the harassers, from the Nazis, from, I mean, you name it, you have all of this strong backlash. So why would you speak up? Like what's, what's, and you don't achieve, uh, nothing changes, right? And so like uh, Chelsea Glasson is one person who spoke up about pregnancy discrimination and Google has been litigating for three years. So their strategy many times is to litigate to tire you out, right? That means um, just draw out the litigation as much as possible, draw, drive up your costs as much as possible. She said that, you know, one of her kids, it, the whole time since she was born, Chelsea's been in litigation with Google. She's so anxious, she had to check herself into like a facility to sleep because she couldn't sleep for one month. And so why is she doing all of this? What's the, po the point, right? So something has to change. I mean, so for me, one is that I had a, safe, uh, a safety net and I wanted to, I was okay walking away from the job. But then two is that I had a lot of support. So that's huge, right? And so a lot of women, you know, who come out, at, like I read all these articles about famous women who came out, uh, you know, out publicly about sexual harassment. Like, where are they now? Would they have done it over again? The vast majority of them said no, because regardless of all of the publicity they received, the backlash was so much stronger. Their lives were, were threatened, turned upside down, couldn't get jobs later, couldn't, you know what I mean? So, so all of this to say is that if we want people to speak up, we really have to make sure to protect them. It's very important to do that because a lot of times you speak up. And so I'm seeing this with some people and like other companies take note, they don't want to hire them and they just kind of low key kind of, you know, sideline them. Right. And so, so that's, that's sort of what I mean. So the, for me, those are the things that were important that I had a safety net, that I had a support system. Um, I mean, like for instance, black and AI. So one of one of the examples here is that after Black and AI started, there was now queer and AI, disabilities and AI, indigenous and AI, Latinx and AI, Muslims and AI. I mean, there's a lot of groups like that. And then there's also like Black and neuro, Black and data, Black and I don't know, like medicine, Black and et cetera, et cetera. So these groups, so Black and AI, queer and AI, uh, widening NLP, now women in machine learning, et cetera, wrote a statement um, ending their, you know, sponsorship relationship with Google. I don't know if it's suspending, let's, let's call it, right? That's, that's a huge vote of confidence. It's saying, you know, that, that uh, we can take a stand now. Like we don't just have to funnel our people to you. So I think that's what I wanted to say is just that the, the support makes a huge, 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 huge difference because you're just constantly being gaslit, right? The other side is that, you know, there's all of this, there were all of these coordinated attacks, for instance, um, people creating fake accounts and like, I just don't even know what their motivation is, all of these coordinated attacks. And then on Google's side, they, what they do is it, it's ruthless. They unleash all of your, you know, the corporate, their um, lawyers. And they can do whatever they want because these lawyers are paid all day, every day to do whatever they want to you. So when they see this support, it's much harder for them to do that, right? They have to, they see that they have to back down a little bit. So then for me, that gives me a motivation to say, okay, like, you know, I, this is worth it. Like I can do, I, you know, I can, I can maybe make a difference. So um, anyways, I know I, I, I spent a lot of time answering this question, but it's very important because I think many times 
when we ask people to do certain things, we don't think about the incentives, right? Um, and I think it's very important to like work on the incentive structure, right? For instance, if I say people shouldn't just work at corporations or academic institutions or only take money from corporations or only take money from the military DARPA, okay, what's the alternative? <laughs> Then I think we also need to discuss, are we working on alternatives? What are we, what are we doing to create um, incentives? Because it's not like all this is not happening in the abstract. I mean, it's real human beings and human beings have a limit to what you can take. Like I definitely was not okay um, in the last few months. I have to tell you like starting December, I mean, I think I, I'm, I look back at my mom and I, I, I feel so bad for her seeing me like that, right? I was not eating. I lost a lot of weight. I... I constantly felt like I had to keep up, you know, speaking up the, my voice because I'm constantly having to counter um, like whatever narrative that they want to say. And that's, you know, as at a human level, it, there's a limit to like how much of that you can take because you're, you're, you're human, you're not a machine. So, um, you know, so we're really not there, honestly, for all the progress we've made in terms of Me Too, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. You look at the actual outcomes of what happens to people who speak up. I'm extremely lucky. Um, I would say my outcome is one of the best uh, because, but then the, the, but the, the thing is, I was also able to take the risk. I was not at the same time worried about like, how am I going to eat tomorrow? I cannot imagine doing that. Like, how am I going to feed kids? I don't have kids, right? Like, how, how do you expect people to take this on when they don't even, you know, they, they don't have a safe, they don't have health insurance if they, if they leave their job, right? Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, I think it's something that's really important for us to think about and work on. Awesome, thank you. Next up, uh, we have uh, Laurel Bonta. Thank you so much for doing this. This is awesome. But my question really relates to how do people who are new to AI and computer vision get involved on removing bias in algorithms and models, especially people who don't have the academic background in data analytics or computer science? Like, mm -hmm. are there volunteer groups we can be involved in or other ways that we can That's a good question. remove this bias? Right. So I think a lot of times, um, even if you're not from an academic um, a background, you can see when something is wrong, right? So like, all the, the people who are involved, um, I mean, being interviewed through higher view, were just like, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I probably wouldn't have done that. I, we're like, oh, you know, next time someone uh, comes to me with that, I'm not gonna, that foresight, you know, I think I would have probably been like, well, I guess this is, this is a standard, so I guess I have to do it, right? So practicing refusal is what uh, CETA, CETA calls it. Um, that you know you don't have to engage with 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 um with everything just because it's there but um so um i would say okay the first thing i think is getting more informed so for me the first book i read was weapons of math destruction and it was very illuminating for me um there's um i'm, I'm writing it on the chat automating inequality now there's also um Ruha Benjamin's um, Race After Technology. Uh, there's Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble. Um, and there's a number of, um, uh, Simone Brown has Dark Matters, or is it Dark Matter? About, um, it's, it's a very short book about history of surveillance in the US, for instance, and technology. So that's one is, is and the movie Coded Bias, it's a, it's a one hour documentary that's a very good, um, kind of summary. Um, I think that is one, just kind of being informed and, and reading more. Um, then uh, when you, to get involved, there's different ways to get involved. So there, there's, for instance, um, look at what kind of activity is happening in terms of, you know, uh, local activity in terms of bans, in terms of potential laws, etc. right? So I, I mentioned um, the, in Detroit, like Tawana Petty, what is it called? The Detroit green light something. I'm sorry, I forgot. Like something about Detroit and green light. <laughs> I'm sure if we look up Detroit and green light, we'll find it. Um, and um, so there's places like AI Now, um, that there's organizations like AI Now, the Algorithmic Justice League, 
So the algorithmic justice league actually has ways for uh, people to get involved. Like you can, um, you can um, like alert them when you see something, like when you see an issue. Um, so they have a list of things to do. Um, and really, honestly, the other important thing here is labor organizing um, and unionizing. These things are very, very tied together because the thing that protects whistleblowers, right, is, is you know, repercussions or the ability to whistle blow. And, um, and then real work, world work discrimination, whether it's AI based or otherwise, is very related because who are the people most likely to speak up or who are the people most likely to say no? They're also the, mo the people most likely to be discriminated at work. They're the people most likely to be negatively impacted by whatever technology we're talking about. It's, it's all the same group of people. So I think labor organizing. So there's the Tech Workers Coalition, um, uh, coalition. There's signs for the people. Um, it's a, a magazine and a group that you can get involved in. Um, I don't know. I think that's it for now. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. So that's that's sort of I think um, for me what I want to say. I and what I want to do is I want to do better at you know kind of can, like putting my research um, in ways that many people can understand, right? Joy Bolomi is amazing at that. Like that's one thing I've really learned from her. So our work, Gender Shades, I mean, she had spoken word. There's the movie Coded Bias. There is, I mean, like the website with visualizations. There's really no reason for people not to know about that work, right? Because it's, it's, it's put in so many different um, uh, ways. So um, so that's that's sort of what I want to do too. But here are some, um, I guess, some starting points for people who are interested in this. Awesome. All right. Well, um, we want to be respectful of your time, so we're going to take one more question and uh, and wrap it up. So next up, uh, we have Victoria. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering what advice you have uh, for women of color that are working to enter into and make change in this field, and how do you maintain momentum when things get frustrating or when progress feels really slow? Oh man, that's a good question. So, right. So. I think that the first thing is to find your support system uh, because it's just very difficult to do anything just as an individual without a support system. The second thing I would say is that whatever your background is, is probably extremely helpful, right? I, I think we always think of ourselves as, if you have an artistic background, you can use that. If you have a history background, if you have a sociology background, this is, I think this is a huge part of what's missing in the, in the field of AI. And so I would say after sort of reading up on things um, and, and, and seeing the lay of the land a little bit, I would think about how to bring that part of me because it's unique, that that um, aspect of me to this conversation and to this work. Um, this is more, I would say, this is more an institutional incentive that I think needs to be worked on uh, and less of the individuals, because it's not your fault if someone's like, oh, we don't need a historian, right? Like, um, that's what I was trying to do at Google. We hired one of the, some of the first social scientists in our team and things like that. So interdisciplinarity, I think, is very important. Um, and I would say, you know, advocacy is also really important. But just, you know, in your own work, um, I don't know if you're, if you're, if, if you're, if you, if you're hoping to work on data science, always thinking about. I mean, I'm just learning how to do this, right? Thinking about you know, whose perspective am I bringing into this work? Like, who, who is this benefiting? Is what I'm building harmful or, you know, should it exist? Um, just, you know, thinking through some of these, what are the potential risks, risks and harms? Um, and yeah, I think those are the things I, I would think about. And I would just really, though, um, find your support system, because I think that you know, you, first of all, you have to survive <laughs> in order for anything to happen. 
and like the goal is for you to thrive and not just survive so you know we should also not forget that right like it's human beings that we're talking about so the first question is like how can you survive and joy always says we, we should go where we're celebrated that's kind of a great thing but like a lot of times we're not celebrated anywhere so how do we create you know like yeah so even so try to like carve out a space where you are like have people who celebrate you or you're celebrated to a certain extent that's what i try to do um at google even i mean i wouldn't have gone there if i didn't have meg mitchell for instance so i was like okay i have one person i can work with one person that's good that's a good start and then we can you know deal with with other stuff together um yeah i think i think that's sort of that's sort of my um, my advice. And I would say, you know, I think we always have to think about, we have to work on institutional changes. Um, like, because, you know, so then I would say, so for instance, in my point, in my work, I was like, okay, I worked on a paper, I worked on something with Joy. She was an, a master's student at the time. Um, my goal is to like advise her because she didn't really have anybody. So, so supported her. She was at MIT. So then Okay, the, the next goal is how do we get that work out there? Um, we really didn't have any conferences that I could think of where we could publish that work. So there are other people who are already working on a conference where we can publish that kind of work. And so I, I, I helped support that, right? Okay, so now we have a venue where we can publish this kind of work. So then if people want to, are academics and they want to do this kind of research, they can publish at that kind of venue. So then, uh, okay, so um, like I want to have it, so I'm working in industry, right? I want to have a team, an interdisciplinary team that kind of works on this stuff. So I tried to work on that. Now I'm like, okay, we need to have a, you know, an incentive for people not to just work at Google or, you know, Actimir or have some, some external entity. And so now I'm working on an ind independent research institute. Um, so I think it's always kind of good to think about, right? When we ask people of something, uh, what you know, what are the incentives that we're we're placing, right? What are the institutional changes that we're um, we're working on? Awesome! Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Timnit. You know, really, really appreciate uh, you know you taking the time to uh, to come talk to us, educate us, inspire us, um, and and we really look forward to to seeing all the amazing work you do. Uh, I know you said, you know, go to the places where you're celebrated. And I know that, you know, DS for a community is a place where you're certainly celebrated. So to all of our fellows, all of our community members, definitely, you know, share your love on, on the Slack channel. And I will make sure that we, we get that love to, uh, to Dr. Timnit. And uh, yeah, again, on behalf of uh, Correlation One and the whole DS for a community, just want to say thank you so, so much again for uh, making time out of your busy day to, to inspire us and, and to talk to us. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. See ya. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert.